I could ask for a show of hands, but I won't. Some of you may have read Shakespeare's Hamlet in high school or in college or maybe just on your own. But in that particular work, he says something. He delivers a soliloquy, and the soliloquy is about life and death. And it's a very pessimistic one, because he looks at life and death as both being terrifying. In other words, he, he, he's scared of both. He's scared of living, and he's scared of dying. The Apostle Paul has just the opposite view. In our text today, he looks at living and dying as both being wonderful opportunities and wonderful things to experience. So on the one hand, we, we have Hamlet and very pessimistic about life and death. The Apostle Paul, very optimistic Remember, Paul, when he wrote the book of Philippians, has been in jail and prison for about two years. And now he's starting to think about life and death. As Brother Holland wrote a number of years ago, one is hardly ready to live until he's prepared to die. And until one is prepared to die, he's not ready to live. Well, Paul faced the dilemma. Well, to live on in the flesh for a while longer or to die and pass on in, into paradise. So what our goal is this morning is to examine Paul's dilemma and then examine our own lives and see how we would answer that dilemma. Our text comes from Philippians chapter 1. As you know, we started Philippians a few weeks ago. <clears throat> and it's Philippians chapter 1, and where our text is mainly verses 19 through 26. 19 through 26. And the first thing we're going to notice is Paul's hope in the first two verses. Paul's hope. So if you're outlining this, and I did not get the outline to Scott this week, He's probably going to shoot me one of these days when I say, I'm sorry, I don't have it ready for you. <clears throat> but this would be the first point, Paul's hope, verses 19 and 20. Notice what he says. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Notice the combination of those two things. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul says, I know. This is the Greek word that means this comes from objective information. There's no guesswork here. Paul says, I am absolutely certain, absolutely certain that this will turn out. Remember, he had been preaching Christ even while he was in prison. Remember, he wrote prison epistles, plus he had been preaching to the palace guard and others. So even though he was in prison, he wasn't allowing that to be an excuse to keep him from working. He was doing it. Regardless of the outcome of his trial, he says, it's going to turn out for my deliverance, my salvation. That's how positive he was that this was in some way going to turn out for good. That's how optimistic he was about it. It was going to turn out for his deliverance, for his salvation. And he says, notice, that it is through two things. And those two things are connected. Through, he says, first of all, your prayer. See, the Philippians were constantly praying for Paul's deliverance. This was something in their daily prayers. This was something they were constantly, regularly praying for. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit was helping Paul, was supplying Paul with what he needed. So we see prayers, man's prayers, and the Holy Spirit working in conjunction. 
Of course, that's what Romans 8.26 says that the Holy Spirit does for us. So the two were working together to bring about Paul's deliverance. So remember when we pray that the Holy Spirit is working with us through those prayers. That's why the Bible says prayer is so powerful. Because it's not based on man alone. And Paul says, according to my earnest expectation, earnest expectation, eagerly expecting it. That's what Paul was. He knew that his deliverance, regardless of what that deliverance was, was going to happen. And he says he hoped that in nothing he would be ashamed. Wouldn't that be a wonderful goal for us that regardless of what we did throughout the day, it was our hope that when night fell that we did nothing to be ashamed of. See, that's what Paul's saying. That's my hope that in nothing I would be ashamed. His conduct, his speech, his thoughts, whatever, would be above reproach. So he says, because of that, with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body. Boldness, unfailing courage. Would we have that much courage if we were in prison? That would be kind of hard. Paul had it. So whether he was in prison or out of prison, Paul says it didn't make any difference. I was going to make sure Christ was magnified in my body. We know what magnified is. We know what a magnifier is. We, we hold it as up something uh, to something and it makes it bigger. That's what Paul was saying. That's what he wanted by his conduct, by, by his actions, whether he was in prison or not. It didn't make any difference. He said he wanted Christ to be magnified so that when people saw Paul, they were really seeing Christ. Christ speaking, Christ acting, Christ doing. That's what Paul said, I want. That's what I want it to be. One person wrote, Paul's body would be the theater in which Christ's glory is displayed. From the time he got up in the morning until the time he went to bed at night, he wanted his life to display Christ. That's what he wanted. So now he starts talking about this life and death. Remember, that's how he ended verse 20, whether by life or by death. He says, either way, it doesn't make any difference. I want both of them to magnify Christ. So the first part of verse 21 says, For to me, to live is Christ. See, Paul had put the old man of sin to death. He had crucified the old man of sin. We turn back a few pages to Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Paul wrote to those churches this very thing. He says in verse 14, <clears throat> But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul said, I've, I've put that to death. I don't live for the world and its substance anymore. What is Paul doing? Paul says Christ is now living in me. In that same book, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, it's no longer I who live. I am not living for me. Christ is living within me. So that goes back to the idea of Paul says, I want to live so that Christ is magnified. What I say, what I do, where I go, where I live, all of that. His entire being, his whole existence was centered around Christ. Christ was his everything. That's why he says, for me to live is Christ. That's what living means to me is Christ. Everything was around Christ. 
He couldn't imagine life apart from Him because He lived only to serve Christ. That's what He's saying. Paul is using his body as an instrument of righteousness. Remember when he wrote Romans chapter 6? Before we become a Christian, we use our members as instruments of sin and unrighteousness, but when we are baptized, come up a new creation, now we use our members as instruments of righteousness. So that's what we do now. So Paul says, as long as I'm living then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to live that time regardless of how much time I have left. A day, a week, a month, a year, whatever. Paul says, I'm going to use that for righteousness sake. My body is going to be an instrument of righteousness. But Paul said also, what about death? You know, Hamlet thought it was, he was terrified of it. Not Paul. Notice what Paul says. The second part of verse 21. To die is gain. Dying in the Bible is just a separation of the body and the soul. James said the same thing in his letter. Just a separation. When the soul leaves the body, that's death. It's not an extinction, it's not a violation. Our soul, who we are, lives on. Now my body changes during life. I don't I don't look a thing like I did when I was Aubrey's age. My body changes. But who I am remains. My soul remains and that part, Paul said, would leave and go to be with God. It's a transition is what it is. So now we come to Paul's dilemma. He says in verse 22, But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. Paul says, <clears throat> For I am hard pressed between the two having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. He says, I'm hard pressed. This is the idea of being hemmed in on both sides. So Paul says it's very difficult to make the decision because both are good decisions. Paul says it's good for me to stay alive, it's good for me to die. He says they're both good decisions. Paul wasn't terrified of either one. Even if he stayed in prison, he wasn't going to be terrified because he was going to use his body as instruments of righteousness. So Paul says, I'm not terrified at all. It's a difficult decision, though. He says, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Paul says, if I continue to, to live, I can continue to preach and teach. I can continue to edify I can continue to go around to different churches and strengthen them. So Paul says there would be much good if I stay on in the flesh. If I continue to live here on earth, there's a lot of good that can be accomplished. But Paul says, as, as far as me is concerned, departing is going to be far better. Why? Because... <clears throat> desire to part and be with Christ is far better. In the original language, it means very far better. And it would be. I mean, the difference with from being chained in a dark prison and being with Christ, that's not really much of a choice. If Paul was thinking purely about himself... But he's not, because he knows if he stays on in the flesh, it's going to be helpful for multitudes of people. Departing. That's an interesting word in the original language. It means you're breaking up camp. You know, if you're campers and you go camping and you have to set up camp and put all this together and build a fire and all this stuff, well, Paul is talking about breaking up camp, leaving this world. It's also a phrase used for 
uh, a ship when it gets ready to sail away. You know, it has to pull up the anchor, get the sails ready. He says, that's what I'm ready to do. He says, being with Christ is very far better. Very far. But Paul was being pulled toward earth. Notice what he says in the last two verses. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by coming to you again. He was confident he would be released from prison and would be with them for a while to help them to grow, to mature in the faith. And when Paul was released, it would be a great time of rejoicing. A great time of rejoicing. So what do I learn from this? And this is the, 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 the real crux of the matter. Can you with Paul honestly say Christ is magnified in your body? If, if, if someone was following you with a great big magnifying glass, what would they see? That's what Paul was saying. What would they see? Would they see Christ brought up close? That was Paul's desire. He, he wanted to live in such a way that he magnified Christ. Christ's actions, Christ's attitude, Christ's spirit, Christ's thoughts, Christ's all of that. He wanted to magnify it in his body. Can you imagine life apart from Christ? If, if, if suddenly there was no Christ, could you imagine that life? Can you imagine not living for Christ? Not having Christ in your life? Can you imagine it? Or would it be little different than the one you now live? Now there's a thought. Would you be living pretty much the same way regardless? What is the focus of your life? Paul said the focus of my life right now is living for Christ. Paul in other places has said he had... He had put away all the things from the past. Doesn't mean anything anymore. And he was just thinking about Christ. Is material possessions your focus? Your career your focus? Your recreation your focus? Your hobbies your focus? And here's one, the last question to really, really take to heart and think. Would the Lord's cause here on earth be hurt by your passing? And think about that one for a little while. Would the Lord's cause here on earth be hurt by your leaving this world? Those are some soul-searching questions that come from Paul's dilemma here. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Can you say that? Can you say, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain? First of all, are you a Christian? And second of all, are you a faithful one? No, those are the important questions. Have you had your sins washed away when you were immersed in water? Have you continued to ask God to forgive you when you repented of your sins? Those are, those are important questions, serious questions. And I want you to think about those questions and the answers to them while we stand and sing this invitation song.